Hello and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where if 2020 was the year of the virus, 2021 seems to be the year of the volcano. We've all seen some really amazing and, and sometimes terrifying footage from Iceland, from Hawaii, and from other places you'll learn about today. It's a fascinating year to talk about volcanoes, and we've got the most fascinating person who talks about volcanoes on TV and at universities, Jess Phoenix here to explain to us all about where volcanoes come from, why they're so exciting, what's really dangerous and how to avoid it, and how we may be able to use volcano science to make the world a better place. So before I turn it over to Jess, just a couple things to, uh, to make sure we get the most out of today's session. She's going to talk about volcanic activity. We want to have some volcanic interactivity here. You guys see the chat panel to the right of the screen. Jess is going to ask you some questions. We want you to answer those there and keep it highly interactive. Also know that if you've got any questions throughout today's program, please type those in whenever you have them. Put your name on them so she knows who's asking. And in the last 10 minutes or so of the program, I'll interview Jess with all of your questions so we can get you answers to everything you ever wanted to know about volcanoes. Also make sure you've got a camera nearby in about a half an hour, we're gonna give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen, get a picture with Jess and maybe some uh, volcanic matter as well. And if you upload that to Instagram after class, we'll have all the instructions for you toward the end. You'll be entered to win a prize package that includes a make your own volcano kit and a free entry in Varsity Tutors Weather Wonders Camp this summer. We'll talk about volcanoes and other amazing natural phenomena. So, all kinds of things to look forward to. Let's get to it. Let me introduce you to your teacher for today, Jess Phoenix. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited that you could join me. I know summer is kicking off for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, it is an exciting time because we're going to be able to get back out in the world. And so take this moment to get excited about the possibility that maybe you might be nearer to a volcano than what you thought. So today we're going to talk about a bunch of different things relating to volcanoes, including where they are, what they are, what kind of dangers they pose, and are they good? I mean, is this something that we can use for our benefit as a species? I'm really excited to dive into this with you all. And I think it's good that we get everything started off with a question. So the first thing I wanted to ask you all is how many volcanoes do you think are erupting right now on planet Earth? Now, I know we're going to get a really wide array of answers and I can already see some coming in here. It looks like we've got people saying zero. All right. Uh, two. 23, that's very specific. Um, one, five, okay. Well, those are all good guesses. I think it might surprise a lot of you to know that there's actually about 45 volcanoes all around earth that are erupting at this very moment. So just because you don't hear about it in the news doesn't mean that volcanoes aren't busy doing their work of creating new earth. And the really mind blowing number is that there are actually about 1,500 volcanoes around the world that could erupt again. So this image here is a map of the world with plenty of little red triangles to show you where volcanoes are found both on land and under sea. And you can also see that this is the ring of fire highlighted for you. You may have heard of that before. It's basically the coasts of North, Central and South America over to the west, uh, where New Zealand and Southeast Asia are, and then up across um, the J J Japanese border, and then into the lower part of Russia, Kamchatka, and then Alaska. So that area is known as the Ring of Fire. And bonus fact, volcanoes have actually been responsible for the creation of several new islands, even just within the last couple of decades. So volcanic processes are ongoing, and you might be surprised to know that they help make Earth what it is today. All right, let's see here. Let's talk about volcanoes. So what makes them erupt? Mm, any thoughts, any ideas? This is, uh, this is one that you may know the answer to. And oh, yep, I see a lot of lavas coming in here on the screen. They, 
it makes sense, right? You think volcano, you think lava, but actually the thing that erupts from the ground uh, when it's underground, it's called magma. It doesn't become lava until it has reached the surface. So magma is actually what you see erupting as well as volcanic ash and gases. So we're gonna talk about those in a little bit more detail, but just so you know too, that you may be closer to a volcano than you think because half of a billion people, so 500 million around the world live near volcanoes. So that is a pretty important thing to keep in mind when we try to understand, well, am I ever gonna have to deal with magma or lava in my life? It's, uh, it's one, of those, um, one of those areas where it's better to know, and then you can decide whether or not you're in a place that might be uh, worth learning about the volcanoes in the area. So now we're gonna go underground. So we already started that way with magma. Now, some of you, if you've had earth science class may already know about what the earth looks like if you take a cross section, a side view. And you can see on the left-hand side of your screen that there is basically, uh, looks like a layer cake. Um, you know, you've got cake and frosting and they're layered together. Well, in this case, it's actually molten rock that is underneath the earth's crust. And there's a lot of different technical names like lithosphere and asthenosphere. Scientists, scientists always have to say big, big names. Uh, sometimes they make sense, sometimes not so much. But in this case, the important thing for you to know is that while the ground we walk on is solid, any of the stuff underground is gonna be a little different because it's really hot down there. And the surface of the earth, the crust, is actually broken into really big pieces so known as tectonic plates. Now, plate tectonics tells us that there's about 12 big plates and then a bunch of smaller ones. And these move around across the surface of the earth because the molten magma underneath will actually push the plates. So it's the earth's mantle is the name of that, that part of the earth underneath the crust. So the movement in the mantle actually causes the plates to shift around. And sometimes, those plates actually collide and then one dives beneath another one, which is the image on the right. You see um, uh, the lower plate, the brown, is going underneath the upper plate with the arrows pointing up. Now, when that lower plate gets hot because it's going deep below, it actually starts to melt. Now, you may have noticed that hot air rises up. So if you have a two-story house, the bottom floor is usually cooler than the top floor. Um, that's true with molten rock as well. So the hot rock wants to make its way to the surface. We can see a great example of hot rock pushing its way up through the Earth's crust in places like Hawaii, where the islands are actually still growing. The big island of Hawaii is actually, there's an eruption going on right now at Kilauea volcano. But the older Hawaiian islands like Kauai and Lanai, uh, a lot of those are not going to erupt again in the future. So there's a hot spot that's actually pushing molten material up through the Earth's surface and creating land even today. All right, so now, this is an important thing to, to address is basically how does all this work, right? I mean, you've got, you know, you've got magma, you've got the molten mantle churning around underneath. Well, why isn't it just everywhere? Well, a good example is to look at water boiling on a stove. So I'm sure a lot of you have watched when water is boiling to cook pasta or something. And basically, if you imagine the earth as, you know, big heater on your stove. And when you turn it on, the water that's at the center of the flame gets heated faster and it will boil to the surface and then it'll move to the sides of the pot and slowly sink down again before it gets heated again and pushed back up. So it's kind of like a conveyor belt action, but for water. And in the case of volcanoes, it's for rock, except it's rock that moves like a liquid. And of course it would be boring and not true to say that, oh yeah, the only thing that's inside of, of magma is water. That's not true. There's actually gases in there too. Lots of different gases. Some of the gases contain acid. And of course these gases, they want to expand as they rise. So it's really important to understand that when a volcano erupts, it's not just releasing molten rock, it's actually releasing 
gases as well. So if you put like, let's say a soda bottle, let's say you have a, a bottle of Sprite or something and you shake it up, you shake it up, the gases inside of it want to expand. Same principle goes with volcanoes, except we don't really have to shake them up. Now, the other thing is a lot of people wonder why some lava is really explosive, like, you know, creates a big, big eruption and you hear about it for miles and miles. And then also um, other volcanoes produce lava that oozes and doesn't make big explosions. So the difference is something called viscosity. And viscosity really just means how sticky is something. So you've got maple syrup, pretty sticky, high viscosity, and then you've got water, low viscosity. Well, magma, different kinds of magma have different kinds of viscosity. So sometimes you get really oozy, runny lava, like in Hawaii, and sometimes you get really sticky, explosive lava, like in Mount St. Helens. Some of you may have heard of that volcano. So, okay, let's talk about types of volcanoes, though, because I did just mention a couple examples here. This is a shield volcano. Now, you may think that doesn't look like a volcano, Jess. Like, that's not what I thought a volcano would look like. And, you know, when, when my teacher told me to draw a volcano when I was a little kid, I made, I made a little triangle. Um, shield volcanoes usually have really runny lavas, low viscosity. So they flow really, really well. And this is Mauna Loa in Hawaii, which is actually the world's largest volcano but it looks so gentle and nice. That's a kind of slope. I mean, you could hike up it. It's just would take you a long time because from the base at the bottom of the ocean to Mount Aloha's summit, it's actually almost 14,000 feet from sea level. And if you go all the way under sea, it's bigger than Mount Everest. So this is a massive volcano and shield volcanoes can be extremely large. So let's look at the next type of lava or not lava type of volcano. Um, that's a cinder cone. And in this picture, you can see that there's several little cinder cones. One of the things you might notice is that their slope is a lot steeper than what we saw on the shield volcano. These are pretty much made up of broken fragments of rock. And you'll see them a lot of times near volcanoes that are towards the end of an eruption. So the magma inside has a lot of gas. It's really frothy. It's almost like the, the white part on top of a um, coffee drink that you might see at Starbucks or something. So that's sort of the end of an eruption. And when, when you do see cinder cones, you can say, oh, yeah, that was a frothy magma. All right. And we'll go to the last major type of volcano, which is a composite or a stratovolcano. Now, stratovolcanoes have kind of a, a more gentle slope than cinder cones, but they're steeper than shield volcanoes. Mount St. Helens that I mentioned before is in Washington state, and it is a stratovolcano. Same with Mount Vesuvius, which was famous for the eruption uh, that destroyed Pompeii back in 79 AD. So stratovolcanoes are made up of layers of fragmented rocks. And they're bigger than cinder cones, but a lot of the time they're smaller than shield volcanoes. So those are our major types. Now, the stratovolcano will generally produce a lot more explosive eruptions than a shield volcano, just because the lavas are different. All right. And then, of course, we need to mention the life cycle of volcanoes. Now, humans, we're pretty lucky if we live to be in our 80s. I mean, we're doing really well if we make it that far. Uh, volcanoes can exist for millions of years and their life cycles, they can change so much and shape so much of the world around them. And every type of volcano has a different life cycle. And as humans, we only get a small window into the lifespan, the whole lifespan of each volcano. So it's really important that we have scientists who are taking notes and collecting data so that we can understand the story of these volcanoes that are so much older than us. And we can use that information to keep people safe from when the volcanoes do erupt. So then let's talk about danger. All right, danger, danger. You can't talk about volcanoes without talking about danger. 
So this is a picture of Mount St. Helens. So I wanted to show you something that it shows the devastation of a volcano. And you can see that there's a part of the mountain that's missing. Uh, that's because St. Helens did erupt really big back in 1980. But let's talk about what makes volcanoes dangerous. What do you all think is the most dangerous part of volcanoes for humans? All right, just put your answers there in the chat. Uh, oh, okay, I see some of them coming in. So there's a lot of people saying lava. Lava is a very popular answer. Somebody said getting your car crushed by rocks. Okay, I mean, that is a danger. Um, burns, heat, I see ash. Okay, well, lava was the most popular answer, but it's actually not correct. Lava is one of the lesser dangers of a volcano in most situations, not all. So on the left, you've got a picture of me wearing a respirator and pointing at a sign that talks about toxic gases. I was in a volcano in Indonesia and it's actually very famous for producing acid gas. So you need the respirator to prevent your lungs from getting injured. So volcanic gases are a problem, but they're not, I mean, it's not a huge problem unless you're pretty close to the volcano. Same thing with lava, because lava will destroy everything in its path, but most of the time, you or I could outrun a lava flow. They move pretty slowly, like as fast as the fastest lava moves like 19 miles an hour. That's not that fast. And usually it moves about six miles an hour. So we could just walk away from the lava. But the most dangerous thing for large amounts of people is oftentimes volcanic ash. So that's not like ash when you burn logs in your fireplace. That's just carbon. Volcanic ash is pulverized pieces of rock that the volcano has fractured into tiny, tiny particles because of the force of the eruption. And that volcanic ash can get ejected up into our atmosphere and it can clog airplane engines. It can cover roofs of houses. It can make the roads disappear under layers of ash. And it's not good to breathe in. And it can even collapse the roofs of buildings. So we're talking about something that will destroy crops that farmers are growing. It can make it so that livestock can't find things to eat. And of course, you know, the idea of being in a plane that's taking volcanic ash into its uh, engine is not a very good idea. So volcanic ash gets overlooked a lot when we talk about volcano dangers. And then there are flows. So there's a couple type of flows that come, couple types of flows that come out of volcanoes. So the main ones that you need to know about are pyroclastic flows. I mean, that's just a cool word, pyroclast. It means fire rock uh, in Latin. So pyroclastic flows are really just flows from the volcano that have debris in them. So big chunks of rock and ash and gas, and they go tumbling down the sides of the volcano at a couple hundred miles an hour. Those are really, really deadly, and you cannot outrun those. So pyroclastic flows are a huge hazard. And then also we have something called lahars and those are volcanic mud flows. So you may know that some volcanoes have ice and snow on them and even glaciers. If a volcano erupts while it's covered in glaciers, that can turn everything streaming down its sides into mud. And those mud flows can just absolutely obliterate houses and roads, even take out parts of forests. So volcanoes have a lot of dangers, but lava is not the most dangerous. So just remember that if you don't remember anything else. You can exp you know, explain that to your friends and they'll say, oh, I thought lava was the, most, the biggest volcano danger. And you can say, well, ash is actually usually more dangerous. That's not to say lava is safe. So don't go trying to run out near an active lava flow, okay? Uh, so let's see, why do volcanoes matter? right? Because obviously if you live in an area and there's a famous volcano nearby, like if you live near Mount Fuji in Japan, you're going to know a little bit about volcanoes just from living there. But why do volcanoes matter? So I wanted to ask you, so we know volcanoes are cool and fun, but what is one way that you think volcanoes have a positive impact on our lives as humans? Okay, I'm waiting for the answers to come in here. Some of you are really quick. Okay, so 
this is good. Somebody listened when I said, uh, you know, the earth is, it's creating new earth for through volcanoes. That's correct. So about 80% of the land on our planet and what's under sea is volcanic in origin. So it was either related to a volcano or connected to a volcano. And somebody said for farming, fertile soil, that is correct too. So the really neat thing to know is that in areas where you have volcanoes, there are so many minerals and elements in that soil that are useful to farming, to growing crops. I mean, if any of you have been to Hawaii or if you are in Hawaii, you'll know just how good it is for growing jungles and vegetation there. And of course, like we also have gold and silver and copper, valuable metals and minerals all over planet Earth, and even diamonds are connected to areas where we have volcanic activity. Now, one thing I didn't see was that anything about what the volcanoes do for the global climate. Now, that's that's actually something that people will say that's a myth. They will say that volcanic eruptions make the planet hotter or that volcanoes produce more carbon dioxide than people. That's false. Volcanoes do produce carbon dioxide, but they produce less than 1% of all of the CO2 that humans produce every year. And because if you remember, I was saying when a volcano erupts and the ash, the little tiny particles get up into the atmosphere, that actually can cause a shielding effect so that the earth basically has a blanket insulating it from the sun. So if you get a big enough eruption, and this has happened a couple times in human history where they've had a big enough eruption, and then for the next year or two, the actual, the, the temperatures all around the world drop by a couple of degrees. And it's temporary, but it's one way that volcanoes actually cool things down instead of heat things up. And that can be a real benefit in, you know, in this era we're living in where the climate is changing. So volcanic eruptions aren't all bad, and that's really important to stress. So I wanted to ask you all another question. After hearing what I just said, would you say that volcanoes are good or bad for people? I mean, or maybe you have a different, uh, different take on them altogether. Put that in the chat too. Okay. Okay, so I see some people saying, I think they're good. I think they're bad because they kill people. And I see some, I don't knows. Well, I mean, I may be a little bit biased because I'm a volcanologist and I study volcanoes for my job, but I tend to think that volcanoes, if you can avoid the destruction, they're really good for people. So a lot of my work is designed to try to make sure that we can keep people safe because we're not going to stop eruptions. That's just not possible. So we as humans, we have to learn to live with our big volcano neighbors. And, you know, all throughout history, people have built homes and communities and farmed on volcanoes. And it's something that we have learned to live with in different ways. And as our societies get more advanced, we have to get even better about protecting people and about understanding how eruptions work so that we can give people warning and so that they don't have to throw their whole life you know, into disarray whenever the volcano nearby acts up. So this is also important to know, and you may have seen volcanoes in the news recently. Right now on the left-hand side of the screen, you can actually see there's a world map and there's five little volcano icons. Uh, right now in the news, you can look this up later if you want, but there are major eruptions that have just happened within the last month or so. And some of them are still going on. So you've got Kilauea in Hawaii that is currently erupting. You have La Sufri in the Caribbean that actually was erupting and caused a lot of people on that island to evacuate. And then you have Iceland, Fagradalsfjall is currently erupting, and you may see some amazing drone footage of that lava because it's the, the real oozy kind, so not a lot of big explosions. So it's pretty easy to get drones up close to get good video. And then in Italy, Mount Etna is pretty active. It's erupting quite a lot right now. And that's a dangerous one. In fact, Mount Etna is, there's about a million people living in the shadow of that volcano. So it's really important that we have a good system in place to warn them if the danger levels go up. 
And then the last volcano that you may have seen in the news is actually, it's kind of the saddest one at the moment. And so it's a volcano called Nairagongo, and it's in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. And this volcano actually is one of those rare times where the lava was the really big hazard. So the lavas from Nairagongo are incredibly runny and they actually went into the town of Goma and they killed people. The lava actually caused people to die and it destroyed a lot of houses. So we're talking tens of thousands of people had to get out of the way of that volcano and not all of them were able to do it. So that's why it's really important that we study this stuff. I mean, I don't want anybody to die because of volcanoes. They're amazing natural features, but they are really dangerous. So we have to also look at the kind of good that they can do for society. And if we go back to Iceland mentally for a second, Iceland is one of the world's leaders in geothermal energy. That's energy that is driven by all the heat that we have under the Earth's crust. And of course, that heat is connected to volcanoes. So where you have volcanoes, you have the possibility of tapping into that extremely green friendly energy source. So we're really watching to see what countries that have volcanoes in them are doing to use that geothermal energy to make sure that as humans, we can live a, a cleaner, greener, more sustainable life. So if any of you are interested in volcanoes as a possible career option, there's a lot of ways you can do that, including in helping us figure out how to use volcanic energy to make the world a better place for everybody. And of course, we need scientists who are focused on keeping people safe from ash fall and lava flows and lahars. That's all really important too. So the way that you can go into uh, volcano science, there's not one right way to do it. There's a lot of options out there. So I wanted to show you all a video. Um, this is a video that I took and We'll talk about it in a second, but I want you to watch it first. Okay, so you see that and you might be thinking right now, oh my gosh, that's blue lava. It's not blue lava, okay? Not lava. What it is, is it's actually this volcano in Indonesia called Kawa Ijen. And this volcano, it has so much sulfur. It's an element, it's on the periodic table for any of you who have done chemistry already but it's an element that this volcano has so much of, the sulfur is erupting from the surface of the ground. So what you're looking at right there is sulfur in a liquid form and it's burning as it comes into contact with the oxygen that's just you know in the air. So basically when you have sulfur that's that pure and it contacts the oxygen, it'll burn. So that because a lot of people, I know you said, oh, it's blue lava. That just proves the point that volcanoes are often pretty misunderstood. So they're, they're an element of life on Earth where we need to do a lot better job of understanding them to keep people safe and, and also just to understand the planet better. They're really beautiful. And you could see that from that video. I mean, it's gorgeous. That wasn't any sort of special color filter or anything. That's actually the color of burning sulfur. So it's, it's clearly beautiful. And you saw the Mount St. Helens picture. I mean, you've seen all the, the photos of lava and videos of eruptions. They're stunning forces of nature, but they are forces of nature. And what they really give us the chance to see is the earth giving birth to itself. It's the only natural process where you can actually see new land being created right in front of your eyes. And there's so much to learn. I mean. I could obviously have talked about this for a year uh, or more, but I hope that's given everybody a pretty good sense of what volcanoes are like and where they are and what to be worried about and what not to worry about. Well, thank you so much, Jess. Hey, thanks to everyone out there. You guys have some amazing questions and we're going to get you some answers coming up uh, right now. But I love how you ended too on the earth giving birth to itself. I think it's such a cool way to uh, to think about Vulcan. They're necessary to give us, you know, the land and the soil and all those kind of things that, uh, you know, that we all take for granted. So um, thank you for a tour of, of volcanoes. The 
way more good. I was going to say the good, bad, and the ugly, but really just a lot of good, some bad, and um, you know, some new things to uh, to, to think about. So um, for everyone out there, a couple things for you. One, keep your questions coming. Um, there have been some amazing ones coming in. We've got uh, at least 10 minutes to, uh, to get you guys some answers to that's great. Also, I mentioned at the beginning, have a camera nearby. Um, Jess has some, uh, you know, volcano swag with her, I guess we call it. You guys can get some pictures with. So get those cameras ready. Remember, if you upload these to Instagram after class and tag Jess and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a free entry in Weather Wonders Camp with Varsity Tutors. We'll break down volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, all the exciting things that, uh, that nature can do. Plus, you'll also be entered to win a uh, Make Your Own Volcano Kit so you can get up close and personal with um, some fascinating but not really dangerous volcanoes. So it'd be perfect. So I think that gave everybody enough time to uh, to get your cameras ready. Um, Jess, I'm going to turn it over to you and let's get those pictures, everybody. All right. Okay, everybody. So I brought three different things that I can use for props here. So take the selfies that you want with all of them or with one of them. Just pick. So first up, we're going to go straight to the good stuff. We have the tiny volcano. So here we are. Take your selfie. <laughs> uh, they, it's, it's cute. I got this. It sits on my desk because, you know, you may know that this is a stratovolcano. So it's very steep. Whenever I show people this, I say, look, I don't have to find a picture. I can just show you the stratovolcano. All right. Item number two. This is a piece of lava. And you can see it's got little holes in it. And it's pretty cool. I mean, I'm holding lava in my hand. So if anybody ever asks you, is all lava hot? You can say, no, I got a selfie with it. Okay. Last but not least, this is my favorite tool as a geologist. This is a rock hammer. This is what I use to take samples of actual flowing lava. So this rock hammer has been in lava that is too thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And it is the best tool on the planet for seeing what's inside all of the rocks that I come into contact with when I work on volcanoes. So here we go. Selfie with the rock hammer. <laughs> and I love this thing. So hopefully some of you got a good picture with this one. Remember to tag yourselves, do all the stuff that Brian said. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Jess. Hope everybody got some great pictures. Again, put them up on Instagram, tag Varsity Tutors and Jess. We'll have the exact handles up on a slide on our way out after Q&A. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Weather Wonders Camp, there's a link on your screen. You can check it out. There can only be one winner, but like volcanoes, there can be dozens and dozens of uh, people that take part. So if you want to register or check it out, that link is there. Now, you guys have had some amazing questions. They're still coming in, and uh, and I love it. So uh, one of my favorites came in really early, Jess. We'll start with this one. Um, a lot of people asked about the temperature. Like, how hot does lava get when it's underground, when it comes out? All those kind of things. My favorite one, Alistair, uh, you know, kudos to you for asking. Can you compare it to the, the temperature of the sun for us? I don't know if you got that comparison queued up. <laughs> or can just tell us, you know, how, how hot is lava, you know, when it's underground and when it comes out? Yeah, so underground, it's way hotter, obviously, because it's insulated. Um, but on the surface, I just mentioned like typical basalt lava, that's the Hawaiian style, really like oozy, runny lava. That's about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So anywhere from 1800 to 2000 degrees is pretty normal. And that, of course, is going to be quite a bit hotter than your average oven uh, at home, which your temperature setting may go up to about 500 degrees. So if you want a sense of how hot that is, just multiply the heat of your oven times four. And then anything underground is significantly hotter, but it's way cooler than the sun. So <laughs> the kind of explosions that we see on the sun and the intensity of the energy that's released just makes it far hotter than anything that we have here on earth, even the earth's molten insides. I'm thankful for that. I think if, uh, if if the underground magma, I think I said lava, I made that mistake uh, again after you told us, if the underground magma were anywhere near the temperature of the sun, I don't think we would have a earth's crust to worry about at that point. So I'm, I'm thankful yeah. for that. Hot enough we'd, without we'd be dead. Because yeah. the sun, of course, if you think about it, the sun isn't doesn't have like any sort of crust on it because it's so hot. It you know the material can't cool down enough ever for any sort of solid state. But here on Earth, obviously, we're further away from the sun. The inside's hot, but the outside is cooler. So we have the perfect spot to have life, which is, makes our planet so special. 
Yeah. And volcanoes help us with that. It's kind of, it's a perfect balance of everything here. So um, I like it. I think I'm going to stick around for a while. Um, hey, another question, you know, we talked about um, volcanoes giving birth to uh, to new lands and islands and things. Um, some, some people wanted to know, so what, maybe a two part question for you. One, you've, you've researched underground uh, volcanoes. You've been down there to check them out. People wanted to know, can underground volcanoes cause damage? I think we worry about the ones on land because, you know, of all the different flows you mentioned, but what about underground? volcanoes like undersea because Unders- i'm sorry yeah. undersea. yeah i figured it was undersea yeah. yep. it's okay great question i mean oh my god the fact that we're even coherent right now uh <laughs> we've all had a hard year um no so undersea volcanoes it's actually i did my master's research because i did i got a master's degree in geology and that focus of the research was an undersea volcano that's off the coast of hawaii so it's going to be the next hawaiian island but in about 100,000 years or so, uh, because it's slowly building itself up. Now, that one isn't a danger to anybody at the moment, but other volcanoes that exist just really shallow, right beneath the surface of the ocean, can cause problems. I mean, if you think about it, if you're a fisherman or you're out boating or something and a volcano that's underwater says, oh, I'm going to erupt, uh, you're going to have the release of, of gas as well. And you'll actually sometimes see pumice, which some of you might recognize as the rock that you use to scrub dead skin off your hands or feet. Um, Pumice is actually a volcanic rock and uh, it is produced a lot of times in in these shallow undersea eruptions. So you can see floating bits of pumice. Um, You can see, uh, they're called pumice rafts actually. And uh, you can also, you can see like roiling in the water where the big gas bubbles from the volcano are coming up and breaching the surface. So you don't want to be directly over one of these undersea volcanoes, but the odds that you ever would be are really, really, really tiny. So don't be scared if you're going out boating, uh, unless, you know, you've looked in the area and the local geology agency says, uh, there's an undersea eruption going on. You probably don't want to go over there. Always listen to the local government experts because they know what is current for wherever you're going to be. That's great advice. Yeah, the, with U.S. Geological Society, is it or survey? Uh, survey, yeah, U.S. Geological Survey. Yes. Mm-hmm. I knew it was an S. Yeah, they um, they've got all kinds of great maps to to let you know sort of what you can expect in different places. Yeah. Um, speaking of fear and and maybe of you know kind of getting in touch with some of those services, there the most common question uh, of all was, are there volcanoes near? blank, wherever everyone lived. And so that's a tough one. We're not going to go through, you know, every zip code of everyone who's here. So maybe let me ask it this way. Um, Where are some of the more surprising places that volcanoes um, either are or have occurred? We saw the ring of fire. We kind of know to expect them around there. Um, Where are some surprising places you might not think of that either have had or we think might have volcanoes? Well, Okay, so a lot of people don't know that depending on what's erupting and you know what day it is, the U.S. either has the second or third highest number of active volcanoes of anywhere on Earth. So you know there's other countries like the Philippines, like Indonesia, um, of course, like Japan that we hear about that have a lot of volcanoes uh, nearby, and of course a lot of the Caribbean countries, South America. But the fact that the U.S. has such a high number of active volcanoes, I mean, we're talking about 170 volcanoes that could erupt again in the future. That means that pretty much the western part of the U.S. is an area where we have volcanic activity. So we're talking like Oregon, Washington, um, Wyoming, um, parts of Nevada, you know, Utah. These are these are parts of the country where we either have geothermal energy or we have old volcanoes or, oh yeah, even California. I live in LA and we actually have uh, geothermal activity producing tiny little six foot tall mud volcanoes down here in Southern California. And then we also have Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen in the northern part of the state that are hazard volcanoes. So we actually have hazard maps of where people living near those volcanoes um, would need to evacuate. Oh, you're in this hazard zone. If this happens, then you need to go. So it is not just Alaska and Hawaii, but it's a good chunk of the western U.S. Now, for folks in like New England or on the East Coast, not something that you should worry about. Uh, you know, you've got your own set of geohazards and volcanoes are not something for you to worry about at all. And for folks in the West, do look up the U.S. Geological Survey. And if you're in a different country, look for your country's geology agency, because 
all over the world, there are different agencies that monitor the volcanoes that could be threats to people in that country. So your country will have good up-to-date information. And if you're just curious, you can go, there's a couple of sites that are really great. One of my favorites is the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program. That's from the Smithsonian Institution. And they have such a great database of volcanoes and the current bulletins about what they're doing and when they erupted in the past. So it's a really great place to go and poke around if you want some more volcano knowledge. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and that actually leads me to another great a series of questions. We're going to package them all together. Um, Liam asked one of my favorite questions, which was, you know, it seems like, you know, the Ring of Fire, the Western the U.S., um, you know, that's where all the platonic, plate tectonics activity is. Um, so he was wondering, um, can volcanoes be set off by earthquakes? Are, are they similar to each other? I also know it's really hard to predict when earthquakes will happen. Do we have any better prediction or how, how, how can we predict um, volcanoes? Do we, do we get much warning? So kind of a two-part question, how do they relate to earthquakes and how, how predictive are we getting with, uh, with when they'll happen? Well, okay. So volcanoes are really kind of interesting because when magma moves around underground, that's hot molten rock, but it's pushing its way through older, colder rock. We call that country rock. And when the magma will break the country rock, we actually generate little earthquakes. So those are different than the big tectonic quakes that we hear about, like when the, the one in Japan happened and messed up the nuclear plant at Fukushima or big quakes like you would see on the San Andreas Fault in California. Those are a different kind than what we see with volcanoes. So the volcano quakes are called volcano tectonic quakes. And that's basically just rock smashing into other rock underground because a volcano is active. So it's a little different. Now, you could have a big earthquake dislodge something underground and it could cause a volcano to increase whatever it was doing, um, but we don't always see them linked. So it's not like you see an earthquake and then a volcano erupts. But when scientists monitor volcanic activity, we have a whole network of seismometers that are out deployed around all of these volcanoes. And the seismometers pick up those smaller volcano tectonic earthquakes that are from magma moving around underground. So they are related, but not in the way that everybody thinks. Now to answer the other question about predicting eruptions, oh my gosh, we can't predict eruptions. I really wish we could. Uh, if you ever see anything on the internet saying, oh, someone predicts a volcanic eruption, that's not true, that's bad information. So what we can do is monitor these volcanoes. We have so many different types of monitoring that we do, including the seismometers or gas detectors or sampling lava. We do all of this data collection so that we can see if something has changed. So what we look for with volcanoes is, is the ground inflating around the volcano or is it deflating? Inflating can mean that a magma chamber is filling up with lava. Deflating means that maybe the lava is draining, well, in this case, magma would be draining out. And so, oh, maybe we shouldn't be worried. That's leaving. So it's it's a really interesting thing that we do when we monitor volcanoes. So because at this point, we can't tell you, oh, it's going to erupt next Tuesday at 3 p.m. What we can say is things are changing at this volcano. So everybody be ready. If we tell you the changes are coming faster or they're getting bigger you're gonna need to evacuate. So if we ever could predict eruptions, that would be fantastic. But in the meantime, we just have to spend a little bit more money to make sure that they're monitored really, really well so we can keep people safe. Thank you. That's uh, that's really good to know. Maybe a challenge for the future volcanologists out there of, you know, maybe you can develop even better prediction tools to help us get that much more uh, accurate, which kind of leads us to, we sort of saved the best for last. We have a couple questions about you now. People really want to know about your experience and, uh, and how they can become more like you. So let's start with your experience right now. Uh, we'll give a two-part um, uh, question right now. One, what is your favorite volcano and then another one a lot of people wanted to know was uh, was about how many volcanoes have you been to or seen erupt can you just tell us a little bit about your experience and definitely about your favorites okay so my favorite volcano is always going to be mauna loa which you may remember from that photo of the shield volcano it doesn't look very impressive from that picture 
But like I said, it is the world's largest volcano, but it was also the first volcano I ever worked on. And something really cool about Mauna Loa, because it's a shield volcano, because it's so, so, so big. I mean, it's it makes up more than half of the land of the big island of Hawaii. I mean, it's just a monster. Uh, when you're at the summit, it doesn't just have a little crater. It just a little depression. No, no, no. Mauna Loa has a caldera at the summit. And a caldera, that comes from the Spanish word for cauldron. So like a witch's pot. Um, but basically, those are only formed when basically the magma underneath, has it's gone out, it's erupted somehow. And so the ceiling of the volcano's chamber there is just suspended over nothing. It's not strong enough, and it collapses. And it forms a really big depression at the top of the volcano. Mount Aloha's caldera is actually several miles across and a couple of miles wide. So it is huge, absolutely huge. And when I stood in that the first time, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm standing on ground that is younger than I am. And it's absolutely massive. It, it's just so cool. So I will never forget that. Uh, my favorite volcano that's of the um, explodey type uh, is, uh, you know, strato volcano is probably El Reventador, which is in Ecuador. And Reventador in Spanish means the eruptor. And when I was there doing work, it was amazing because it was erupting every 30 minutes. So we would be trying to do some work and then, you know, the volcano would start erupting and everyone would go, wow, I just stare at it for a few minutes because it never gets old. Now we were in a spot where we were in very low danger where we were, but you can never totally relax on a volcano. And then what was the rest of the question? Because clearly I got carried away. <laughs> That, I think you covered it really well, actually, was uh, people okay. wanted to know, you know, just kind of about your experience. We had a lot of questions oh, yeah. about your experience. Yeah, um, I, so can, I can mention that, too. Like, I didn't start out trying to be a volcanologist. That wasn't like when I was a kid, when I was like probably the ages of some of the people watching, I wasn't like, oh, yes, this is what I'm going to do. I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. <laughs> so uh, and then when I went to college, I thought I was going to be an English professor. Um, but I took a class in, in college and it was just intro geology and it answered big picture questions like how do mountains form? Why are the oceans where they are? How do volcanoes work? And I was just amazed. I mean, my, my whole mind was blown because I just thought that, yeah, of course we know everything about earth, right? I mean, we're already going to space. We should be just done with earth. Uh-uh. Like we have so much more to learn and, and there are answers to so many of the questions that when you're young, you just ask these questions like they're normal. But as you get older, there's all this pressure to just, you know, get the job and pay your bills and, and it's good. So if all of you watching can hang on to that curiosity, then who knows where that curiosity will take you as you get older. You may be like me, take a class on geology and then think, okay, changing the whole direction of my life. And I mean, I had never been camping even when I went on my first camping trip when I was 23 years old. And it was a geology camping trip because geology involves a lot of camping. So if you like camping, but you also like science, maybe look at geology. <laughs> Perfect. Well, great advice. And that really kind of answered the last one was a little bit of advice for those who realized by talking to you that uh, they love learning about volcanoes and actually someone might pay them to be able to do that. So that was really the last one we have. Any, any more advice you have for the, the folks out there that just want to be more like you? Oh my gosh. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know if you want to be exactly like me because I definitely gave my parents a lot of gray hair uh, telling them, oh yeah, I was down inside a volcanic vent today and sending a picture and my parents going, where's your safety harness? And I'm like, oh, it's okay. I was with all these scientists. We had it figured out. So you could give your parents a lot of gray hair, uh, but Definitely. If you love learning, use your curiosity, use that as a tool, because asking questions, that is how we grow. That's how we grow our understanding of the universe and of our place in the universe. So, you know, whenever we think about not asking questions, you're letting ignorance win. Don't do that. Um, ask the questions, but make sure that you're asking people who know their stuff, right? Because you want to get good information. And do tell people what you're interested in. So stay curious, but tell people what you love. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll meet you at the grocery store someday and you say, I love volcanoes. And I say, ah, oh, 
I'm a volcanologist. I have some info for you. So do that because you never know. Like your parents, sister's brother's cousin might be a geologist and can bring you in for a tour of the office or take you out on a field expedition. So ask people about what they like and tell them what you love because that's how you can make the connections that will open doors for endless possibilities for your future. That's really great advice. People, uh, people love talking about what they're passionate about and, and, you know, know a lot about. And so if you ask questions to people who know a lot about what you're fascinated by, you're bound to get some answers and maybe more help than you bargained for. So, um, hey, just thank you for, uh, for indulging all of these questions. Thanks to all of you for asking such amazing questions. And, uh, you know, to Jess's point about being curious, uh, I think that kind of leads us to remember, if you put that picture up on Instagram, I'm going to get the official hand handles up here so that uh, you guys can see exactly who to tag. Uh, if you get those pictures up on Instagram, tag Jess, tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be able to keep that curiosity up with a uh, Make Your Own Volcano kit and with an entry in uh, one of the Varsity Tutors summer camps, the Weather Wonders camps will cover volcanoes and things, but there are plenty more where that came from. So <laughs> check all those out. Uh, do please stay curious. Keep asking those questions. Uh, we'll be back soon with more exciting classes. Jess is coming back a little bit later in the summer to talk uh, even more about geology. So huge thanks, Jess. Thanks to all of you and uh, have a great night, everybody.